Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The time is now 9.45, and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Ed meeting of January 13, 2015, is called to order. Um, first item is approval of agenda and order of priority. And um, you have information folders in front of you. Is there, is there a motion? Moved by John. Supported by Cassandra. Any discussion? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Thank you. That means our posted agenda is the one we're going to use today. Uh, Mertz, introduction of, of board members and others, please. I'd like to introduce you to the people seated around the table, and we'll start on my left. This is Mike Flanagan. He's the State Superintendent of Public Instruction. He serves as Chairman of the State Board of Education. As we go around to the left, John Austin, President of the Board. He resides in Ann Arbor. The Vice President of the Board is Cassandra Albrich. She resides in Rochester Hills. Lupe Ramos-Montini is a board member from Grand Rapids, and at her first official State Board of Education meeting is Pamela Pugh-Smith from Saginaw, Yay. board member. And then the Michigan Teacher of the Year, who is seated at the table for a year, is Melody Arabo. She teaches at Keith Elementary School. She's a third grade teacher. That's in the Wald Lake Consolidated School District. And as we go across um, the table, you'll see Eileen Weiser. She's board member from Ann Arbor. Kathleen Strauss, board member from Detroit. Michelle Fecto, she's the board's NASB delegate, National Association of State Boards of Education. She's from Detroit. And next to me is Richard Ziley. He's the board's treasure, treasurer, and he is from Dearborn. Thank you. And uh, Craig Ruff, who has for a year or so been representing the governor at the table, uh, has retired, and I, my understanding is they haven't replaced him yet, so I don't think there'll be someone at today's meeting unless we hear otherwise during the meeting. Or if someone shows up, that's probably the new <laughs> advisor. Um, and then we also uh, welcome guests who are in the audience. So um, if, if you'd like to, we appreciate you joining us, and we'd invite you to introduce yourselves. Uh, Linda, you're not a guest, but you're sitting out there, so why don't you start? Linda Forward, the Director of the Office of Education Improvement and Innovation. Good morning. I'm Kristen Harmelin. I'm from a company called UGOV. Um, we are a global company, and I'm based out of Canada. Good morning, I'm Judy Cloud-Webb, and I'm from the Interim Director, Executive Director of the Michigan STEM Partnership. My name is Bolton, I'm Executive Director of Learning Forward, Michigan. Good morning, I'm Deb Sean from Educational Testing Service at Princeton. Good morning, Judy Pritchett from Macomb Intermediate School District. Tara Slonger, Calhoun Intermediate School District. Gloria Chapman, MDE School Reform Office. Danielle Friday, School Reform Office. Loretta Cunningham Powell, School Reform Office. Marla Moss, Office of School Support Services. Juanita Washburn, um, parents of Cassandra Aldrich. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get to you in a minute. I'm Marty Ackley uh, from the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs. I'm Alice Ann Henry with the Superintendent's Office. Uh, Kyle Brown from the Michigan School Support Services. Mr. Brown, I'm going to start. Natasha Baker, Education Services. Vanessa Kiesler, Accountability Services. Wendy Larvick, Office of Public and Governmental Affairs. Caroline Nathan, Public and Governmental Affairs. Ben Williams, MD. J Jacob Kanzler, Reporter for MERS News. And Marla, we don't want to not acknowledge, I know, Ohio State won last night. You got your <laughs> colors on there. We think, um, yeah. Arbaugh and Antonio are going to have their challenges now. This recruiting just even got better. Um, and by the way, I thought I'd mention right up front, I was planning during my SIPS report later to talk about SAT, ACT. Even though we don't make that decision, a lot of people think we do, and there's a lot of controversy around it. But given that ACT has uh, filed an appeal on that and there's a process that will go through, then we're going to just reserve any comment. I don't want to accidentally complicate something. But um, all good intentions, I'm sure, on both vendors' parts. So we'll just let that part play out. I intend to make money. <laughs> you can say that. So I just thought with the, this is kind of our 
every two years is a time to celebrate people that are willing to serve the state as state board members. And this really is, I've said to a lot of people, especially people who have asked me about, uh, given that I'm retiring, have asked me about this job. I've said one of the things that just understand is these are folks that put themselves out there in a statewide election and then they do it for all the right reasons so kind of to set the tone for the day when we're going to actually they've already been sworn in but we do our <laughs> our ceremonial swearing and also today but we thought we'd just start with uh, uh, some things related to the kids in this state just to set the tone because uh, we appreciate very much what Cassandra and Pamela are, are offering up as their uh, service to everyone in the state first one is uh, this came from we I got in a little trouble a few years ago because we thought we just joined the rest of the state and on when you can bring your kids to work day we said you know if you want to bring your kids to work in fairness we got a, I got a fair amount of criticism that we were encouraging kids to get out of school so I backed off of that and what we've redone is we said during that week around uh, the holidays when they're out of school anyway we set up our own and a fair number of our staff and uh, kids, grandkids, neighbors, others have shown up. I saw that, but who did that? It's done really well. Mike Clemenio. Mike Clemenio. Well, thank you, Mike, wherever you are. And then I know we're, we invited the board and hope you're able to make uh, the School for the Deaf graduation a little later this year, but um, I wanted to just uh, show you a quick video. Again, these are kids more directly related to us because we directly operate that program and just thought it would be uh, fun to just see a quick video clip from that, that occasion and then invite you to come early that day of graduation because uh, there's a little luncheon we'd like you to attend if you're available and also to be able to uh, take a tour. I'm sorry, the date for that? Do we know it? We've sent okay. that to you, but we'll, we'll get yeah, that I in a moment. It. When the video's over, we'll have it. Okay, I missed it, sorry.
None of you were able to make that particular date, but um, as I said, I would encourage you. It's June 4th is the actual graduation date. We could arrange a tour and then have lunch and then actually go to the graduation. And I think you'd be really impressed. Uh, the kids who took us around were really. When were you there? Is that recent? Yeah, maybe a month or two ago. Oh, you're good, David. <laughs> So we encourage that. We think you'd really enjoy it, and they'd look forward. It'd really be honored if you could attend and, and give you a tour yourself. You talk about having one of our board meetings at the School for the Deaf. I think we should still do that. I think that would be a very appropriate meeting place for us. I've visited, and it's a lovely facility, and the, the spirit there is marvelous. I've been there a number of yeah, times, yeah. but I think for the whole board and to see it together uh, would be very helpful. Well, that's, a, that's a board call, of course, but they can set that up. Anyway, it was a positive day. I think you would have a positive day on June 4th, and then I think you're certainly welcome to consider uh, Kathleen's request on attend, uh, having a meeting there. So we're going to get right into really something that's a highlight every two years for us, and it's, a, it's somewhat of a ceremonial swearing in because of the fact that you both were sworn in officially along with the governor and those other folks on January 1. Um, and it's, I've really considered it a privilege in my time here as chair of the board. It's the custom to have a ceremonial swearing in that I get to do that. Uh, Pamela Hugh Smith and Cassandra Elbridge were elected by the voters on November 4th, as you know, in the general election. And Cassandra's, it's, it's very interesting that she's beginning to, her second eight year term. A lot of people even in these conversations about the position here, don't realize these are eight-year terms, and I think that makes a lot of sense so you have less political pressure on you than some other folks that are running every two years. Uh, and Pamela is beginning her first eight-year term. We really appreciate her service and willingness to step up. And now we've got a lot of sections of the state represented. It's been Lupe brought the west side in just two years ago, and the important uh, Saginaw area is really great for us to have a representative from that area. So thanks so much for your service to the kids of Michigan and MDE. Um, I had a short poem and I forgot to bring my iPad in. You know what, I'm gonna do the, I'm gonna do the official swearing in and then I might just read that anyway at the end. So if both of you would come up, this is the more appropriate way we do this. And then we're gonna introduce some of your guests after you're sworn in. <laughs> Do you solemnly swear? Do you solemnly swear that I will support? That I will support the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of this state. And the Constitution of this state. And that I will faithfully discharge. And I will faithfully discharge the, the duties of the Office of State Board. The duties of the Office of State Board of Education. Of Education. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you. John Monk. Who? 
to Michigan because um, he came to teach at Delta College in, in the Saginaw area. So grateful to have him. We can have Pam. Do you want to? Yeah, come on. You go over there. Okay. Oh, you're going to being here uh, today. This is Val Washburn. Uh, Val is a retired plumber, a proud union member for 30... 40. 40 years. Long <laughs> <laughs> 40. And my mother, Juanita Washburn, who is also uh, retired, worked in the auto industry for many, many years, and is probably happy to finally be in Lansing when she doesn't have to be protesting something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to worry about this. She doesn't have to hold any signs. Um, so it's it's a pleasure to have them here, and thank you so much. Thank you. And I should say that my mom's not able to make it. You should all know that she um, had a miraculous healing, but she had um, a heart attack on election night. So oh, wow. she's doing much Sorry. better. <laughs> no, that was the next day. <laughs> that was a long night. Do you want John or Mike? Yeah, come on, you guys. All right. You know the heart attack joke? Or? Thank you. Yeah, I'm sure those his professional camera will be better than mine, but still. <laughs> you just paid the bill. Yeah. Thank you. No, I will read this with your permission. I, I, um, this is a favorite poem of mine, and it just, I read it once in a while to remind myself, actually. It's called, it's called For a New Position um, by a guy named O'Donoghue. May your new work excite your heart, kindle in your mind a creativity to journey beyond the old limits of all that has become wearisome. May this work challenge you toward new frontiers that will emerge as you begin to approach them, calling forth from you the full force and depth of your undiscovered gifts. May the work fit the rhythms of your soul, enabling you to draw from the invisible new ideas and a vision that will inspire. Remember to be kind. Can I get to that part? You know what, I'll finish this one later. <clears throat> Take a sip. <laughs> Christmas Eve, we always read The Night Before Christmas, and um, there's a little children's book about the dove bringing the jewel to Christ out, and I start crying every time I go through that second book. Yeah. That's the joke in our family. They, oh, no, we can't read that. that I <laughs> 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 the dove from the rapture. <laughs> yeah. I totally understand <clears throat> well, just re remember to be kind to those who work with you. Endeavor to remain aware of the quiet world that lives behind each face. Be fair in your expectations. 
compassionate in your criticism. May you have the grace of encouragement to awaken the gift in the other's heart, building in them the confidence to follow the call of the gift. <clears throat> May you come to know that work which emerges from the mind of love will have beauty and form. May this new work be worthy of the energy of your heart and the light of your thought. May your work assume a proper space in your life instead of owning or using you. May it challenge and refine you, bringing you every day further into the wonder of your heart. So Pamela and Cassandra, thanks so much for your service. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And that was without even showing my grandkids this morning. <laughs> 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 How did we not right. sneak that in as usual? <laughs> they weren't in any of those pictures? No, they weren't. Really? Well, you know, now that I think I about it, thought. Landon sure was they here. Would have been in there. Yeah, we didn't get she that one. Pictures. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah, I did have one. He sat right here. He sees himself as a future state superintendent, I think. So thanks so much and appreciate the family attending. That's really exciting for us to watch. So the next part, I'm going to, it's my duty to kind of uh, work through this formally. This is the formal election of State Board of Education officers for 2015-16. So each odd year, well, <laughs> each year is kind of an odd year in its own way, but this <laughs> odd year numerically, according to the bylaws, the State Board of Education members elect officers for president, vice president, secretary, tre treasurer, and NASB delegate, which is the National Association of State Boards of Education. So this will be a little cumbersome. I'll repeat this process for each of the offices, president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, and delegate. So let's start with president. Um, the nominations are in order for the office of president. Are there any nominations for that office? Cassandra. Uh, I would like to nominate John Austin for president. Support. Support. Okay. I think I get to that in just a moment. Oh, I'm not, sorry. Uh, are there any oh, Are there any other nominations for the office of president? If not, I declare the nominations closed for that office. Um, so, part of the process is uh, John. Do you accept the nomination? I, I will. And Merch, would you please make a roll call? There's not really a second required if that. Happens the way we just did it. Austin? Yes. Fecto? Yes. Ramos Montini? Yes. Pew Smith? Yes. Strauss? Yes. Albrich? Yes. Weiser? Present. Siley? Epstein. Okay, now, do you want to handle this next part or do you want me to? If someone, if someone abstains, they're given the opportunity to vote before it's announced by, by your procedures and bylaws. So then I go back and I say, um, um, Mrs. Weiser, do you wish to cast a, a vote? No. Dr. Ziley? No. Okay. Okay, then I declare that John Austin is elected to the Office of President. Congratulations, John. Thank you. A couple things. One, I appreciate uh, the vote and your support. My first commitment to all of you and everybody in the state is to continue to help us advance uh, policies, identify and promote them that can help us improve learning outcomes for, for young people. I'm going to continue uh, to work hard to try to help us work together on a bipartisan basis and to work constructively with the legislature and the governor, uh, particularly important work like picking the next superintendent, uh, and I will continue to make that effort. Um, in doing so, though, I think we did not um, shy away from uh, being strong advocates for policies that can help us improve learning and do our job to provide some policy leadership in terms of what can improve education. So that's my continued commitment to all of you. Thank you, John. So I'm going to repeat this process now for Vice President. Um, nominations are in order for the Office of Vice President. Are there any nominations for that office? Kathleen, please. I'd like my, uh, Cassandra Oldridge. Second. Yeah, I do that. Are there any other nominations for the Office of Vice President? 
and I declare the nominations closed for that office. Um, Cassandra, do you accept the nomination? I do. So, Merch, would you please have a roll call? Austin? Yes. Fecto? Yes. Ramos Montini? Yes. Hugh Smith? Yes. Strauss? Yes. Albridge? Yes. <laughs> Weiser? <laughs> Abstain. Siley? Abstain. Mrs. Weiser, do you wish to cast a vote? No. Dr. Ziley? Okay. So I declare Cassandra Albrich elected to the office of Vice President of the State Board of Education. Congratulations, Cassandra. Thank you. Oh, uh, <laughs> I don't, yeah, no speech is necessary. Just want to thank you, and, and um, I, I look forward to continuing to serve in this role, and I appreciate your support. Great, thank you. The next office is Secretary of the State Board of Education. Nominations are in order for that, uh, that position. Yes, I would like to nominate Michelle Fecto for the position of Secretary. Are there any other nominations for the office of Secretary? Then I declare the nominations closed for the office of Secretary. And Michelle, do you accept the nomination? Yes. She does. And so, Mertz, please have a roll call for the Office of Secretary of the State Board of Ed. Austin? Yes. Fecto? Yes. Ramos Montini? Yes. Pew Smith? Yes. Strauss? Yes. Albrich? Yes. Weiser? Yes. Siley? Yes. Okay, well, then I declare. I declare uh, Michelle Fecto elected to the Office of Secretary of the State Board of Education. Congratulations, Michelle. Thank you. Take good notes. Take good notes. Yeah. <laughs> Turn the recorder on. Yeah. Uh, next would be the Office of Treasurer. And I'll repeat, are the nominations in order for I'd like Treasurer? Let me make a nomination for the Office of Treasurer. Let me note, um, since I was elected under Kathy's leadership, and the board was 5-3 Democratic, uh, we always uh, worked to ensure that there was bipartisan leadership, symbolically, mostly in our officer ranks. We had three Democrats and two Republicans. When we turned to 6-2, we uh, have four officers, Democratic and one Republican. Uh, we and I and the Democrats are certainly eager to continue that symbolic uh, effort to show that we're working together in a bipartisan way. It's my understanding, however, that my Republican colleagues are not willing to accept a nomination for treasurer. Uh, unless that's not the case this morning, I will nominate uh, Pamela Pugh Smith for that office, but also note um, some disappointment that uh, that, and just note that that olive branch of bipartisanship was extended by the Democrats. If I may respond, please, I know it's out of order, but a point of personal privilege. <clears throat> the actual response to that is that the treasurer's position has no role. There is nothing that uh, our state constitution um, uh, it says that we are to um, uh, be part of the process in, in school finance, K-12 finance, and having a treasurer's job on the masthead that has nothing to do with that implies that somehow we do have a function in, um, in legislative appropriations, which we did not. And except for managing the flower fund, which is a minimal role, and I don't even think we're doing that anymore, are we, Richard? What we actually forwarded to John was that we believe the office should be deleted from the bylaws, uh, and that we were not willing to serve in a role that had no had no meaning. So, as a former treasurer, it is totally symbolic, yep. but it is an important symbol it, that we've animated historically to have bipartisan officers. And again, disappointed that that's not uh, possible today. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so nominations, we didn't get to this yet, right? That's good. Nominations. Nominated Pamela. You did. I'm sorry. Apologize for that. So nominations have, uh, are there any other nominations for the office? Then I declare the nominations closed for the office of treasurer. And Pamela, do you accept the nomination? Thank you, ma'am. And Mertz, so please take a roll call. Austin? Yes. Fecto? Yes. Ramos Montini? Yes. Hugh Smith? Yes. Strauss? Yes. Albrich? Yes. Weiser? Abstain. Ziley? Abstain. Mrs. Weiser, do you wish to cast a vote? No. Dr. Ziley, do you wish to cast a vote? No, thank you. Okay, so I declare 
Pamela Pugh Smith, elected to the Office of Treasurer of the State Board of Education. Congratulations. And finally, did you? Finally, uh, delegate to the National Association of State Boards of Education, also an important role. Um, nominations are in order for that that office. Are there any nominations, John? From the west side of Michigan, I am proud <laughs> to nominate Lupe Ramos Montigny for NASB delegate. Are there any further nominations? Yes, ma'am. In the spirit of bipartisanship mentioned before this for the Treasurer's Office, acknowledging that Lupe would be a great NASB delegate, I wish to place a nomination for Richard Ziley, who also is interested in the position. Okay. So, um, first of all, Lupe, do you accept the nomination? Absolutely. Yes. And Richard, do you accept the nomination? Mm -hmm. So I declare the nominations closed for that office. Uh, Mertz, a roll call, please. Okay, now you will vote by name when I call your name for for either Lupe Ramos Montini or Richard Ziley. Austin? Ramos Montini. Ziley? I mean, I'm sorry. Fecto? Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, Ramos Montini, although I do think you'd be a good. <laughs> Ramos Montini? Ramos Montini. <laughs> Pew Smith? Ramos Montini. Strauss? Ramos Montini. Albrich? Ramos Montini. Weiser? Richard Ziley. And Ziley? Ziley. 6 2. 6 2. So I declare Ramos Montini elected to the office of um, delegate to the National Association of State Boards of Education. Congratulations. <laughs> I'd just like to point out that, that Richard Siley is a member of the Board of Directors of NASB and will be going anyway. So, so we we're going to work together. We'll get a twofer. Yeah, that's right. That's, thank you for that. We have a twofer then. And um, I would just say, as a guy not far from the end here, that uh, I do appreciate, I mean, not literally, I hope, but the Short termer, I think, is the short termer is a better. Call that retirement. Retirement. <laughs> Thank you. These are all clarifying words. You never know. But I, I really uh, have appreciated very much the the way the board has worked together, and and I, you know, this is a little tension today, but I think it's uh, overcome by eight people that I have a lot of respect for, and uh, first and foremost, in your minds and our minds as a department, on your behalf, are the kids in the state. So appreciate the way you work together and we'll continue. We really are a model for the rest of the of, of the legislature and others that don't work as well together as we do. So thank you for that. <clears throat> so we're going to run right to item C, which is a committee of the whole. That's W-H-O-L-E. And it's the first item on today's committee of the whole agenda. I'm going to ask uh, Natasha Baker and Linda Ford and their guest, our guest, to join us. And then I'll make a few comments to open once they have a seat. And before I make my comments, remember Natasha Baker has agreed to not only handle her former duties as state reform officer, but in addition um, is the deputy superintendent for education yeah, services. And, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, this is kind of her first role in that sense up at the table here. So let me just let me just make a few comments. One of the keys to successful student outcomes. I'm going to let you get these first. Rule number one in classroom management here. <laughs> that takes me back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 101. So, it, we're really. Um, Linda's been a leader on this, and you'll see that in a moment. But one of the keys to successful student outcomes in schools is that is that our kids are engaged in their own learning. And the Office of Education Improvement and Innovation has collected data from 5,000 students in this state, and at least one parent of each of these students, as well as teachers, principals, and superintendents, regarding how well students are engaged in their education. 
the board saw a report a year ago about the data and its implications. And since that time, we as a staff have been working with experts in the field to determine a way to engage students and to hear their voice. And I think Kathleen's the first one I heard speak about this many years ago, that it's how important it is to hear the student's voice and try to understand their needs and engage them. So the result is what we call the Student Inspiration Project, which is a, it's a multifaceted campaign designed to engage students and help them improve their involvement in school. So our team is prepared to launch this project with your feedback, and we really would like exactly what you're thinking today. Um, including any constructive thoughts you have uh, about how we might alter that a bit. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Deputy Superintendent Baker. Good morning, and thank you, Mike. Um, as Mike mentioned, the Student Inspiration Project is really about student engagement. And as you know, we work diligently here at the department to increase student achievement. But at the end of the day, we know that some <coughs> students aren't engaged and neither are their peers. Um, so our staff, um, they've really been working um, They've been really working hard and closely with the market research experts to design a program to catch the attention of students and to encourage them um, to engage in learning. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Linda Ford in the Office of Education Improvement and Innovation um, and Kristen Harmeling, a partner at uh, YouGov, an internationally recognized professional research and consulting organization. Thank you. Looking forward to this. Um, many of you will recall last year we presented you with a lot of data on how students felt and how well they were engaged or not engaged in their education. Before I go any further, I do want to acknowledge that we have worked on this project with uh, Dr. Barbara Markle, who just came in uh, at MSU, and her team. And so um, she's been a part of this project and this work as we've gone along. What we'd like to tell you about is what's happened since last we shared the information with you a year ago. Um, First of all, just let me set the context. You know we've got lots and lots of work going on. Uh, you've, you've heard us talk about uh, new standards. You've heard us talk about closing the achievement gap, about raising achievement, about digital learning. Uh, how do we use that to increase um, student learning? And a lot of other pieces to get our students to a career and college-ready position in the world. All of that's wonderful uh, as long as we engage the students. And when we fail to engage the students, that falls by the wayside. Engagement can go anywhere from, hey, I'm bored today, I'm not tuning you in, bye, i got other things going on in my life. It can be um, something where students just say, you know, I don't do that very well. I don't do math well. Well, math is a key to getting into the rest of what you're going to need to do in life. And so how do we get kids engaged in a lot of their learning and how do we keep them from rejecting school? So that's what we're going to try and share with you today because it's a, it's a multifaceted project. I hope you'll enjoy it. Kristen? So thank you very much for having us here this morning. So last year, Linda shared data with you that showed that students know that their disengagement with school is a problem. We posed a question in an online survey to Michigan students, nearly a thousand of them, and we asked them, if you had to pick the three reasons, and we did give them a list of reasons, if you had to pick the three reasons that Michigan schools might not be doing as well as they could, what are those reasons? 64% of kids told us it was the number one response, the most popular response, that kids not being motivated to learn is what's holding achievement back. Um, this was wildly eye-opening for all of us, and it really made us focus further research, whether it was in-person interviews or more quantitative survey um, experiences, to understand what was happening in regards to student motivation. So Linda shared with you last year, and we have since updated these data, so the data I'm going to share with you this morning um, in voiceover, because we know you spent a lot of time looking at data last year, is from this September 2014. So we learned that 6 in 10 kids agree that it's okay to say, I'm not good in math because some kids just don't get math. Now math is an easy one to answer, and probably we're not that surprised, but we also posed that about science, about writing, and about reading. The same percentage of kids told us that, you know what, some kids, they're just not good in that. It's okay to say, you know, give yourself a pass on that. It's just not my thing. We also learned that students are not convinced all the time that the content being taught in school is meaningful. 62% of students in Michigan said that they believe schools focus too much on memorization and not enough on thinking. Only four in 10 said that students understanding why they're being taught the things they're being taught is something that describes their school very well. 
So there's a disconnect. They don't understand why they're being taught what they are expected to learn. They also told us that content isn't always delivered in ways that inspire engagement. They told us that it wasn't just that technology makes learning fun. They actually articulated that technology has some real benefits in terms of I could go home and watch a video and catch up on what I didn't understand in school. Or if I have technology, it will help me learn at my own pace. And last, we saw data that showed that students believe that academic achievement and classroom engagement can put their social standing at risk. 50% of kids, and this is higher among children in lower income homes, say that they worry what their friends might think of them. They, excuse me, they, they say that trying to do well in school is a reason that kids get made fun of in their schools. And as I mentioned, this is also more prevalent of an attitude among children from lower income homes. All of this is in the context of this being the most empowered generation of children ever. Um, we know that kids, parents, recognize that their children are in control of their own learning at very young ages. Linda shared with you last year when we asked parents, at what age do your children decide how much reading to do for fun, for example? Parents told us on average that age is nine. Parents told us that children take control over the amount of effort they want to put into school at the age of 10. So kids taking ownership and deciding at a personal level, level whether to accept or reject learning happens quite young and this is absolutely recognized by parents. Kids are also independent consumers. Parents told us that about that same age, kids sort of take control over whatever money they have to spend. We as parents do give our children choices for better or for worse. The idea here is that kids are expected to be in control of many dimensions of their own life. Not only do they expect to be in control, they expect to have options that as a youth marketer, I call just for me. This means that companies are producing products directly for children of a certain age, certain gender. They're marketing those products to children on television networks that were created just for children. They expect to have a high degree of customization, whether it be on customizing their sneakers or their jackets or their cell phone cases. And last, kids expect to engage on their own terms. The use of electronic devices starts young and only increases as children age. But here's what happens at school. We expect those same students who have all this control and over their other aspects of their life, we expect them to cede control to adults, accept top-down rules that they usually are not a part of creating, follow schedules, they have little input on when and how to use technology, they're expected to accept a one-size-fits-all model very often, they're expected to sort of detach from their social circles and focus on the classroom content, and they're expected to oftentimes forego their personal interests. We're not saying that those things are necessarily bad, but mm -hmm. we've got to do something in order to engage the kids a little more, uh, a little more authenticity. So what are our goals with this project? In order to succeed, in order to ensure the success, we would like to do the following. Build student enthusiasm for school and learning. We've got to have them be engaged and be happy to be there. We want to strengthen the bonds among the stakeholder groups, such as students, teachers, and adults. We want to motivate the stakeholders to play their role across all of the challenges <coughs> and changes that are going on in education today. And we want to give <coughs> students a voice in that work. Since we met, we've uh, moved forward with our project, and we want to grab something, grab their attention and help them. And so we took a look at the research and we put together an umbrella initiative that we're calling the Michigan Student and Inspiration Project. Um, we also then engaged with a global advertising leader. I'm using those terms and I believe them sincerely when you see that what Leo Burnett does, what he's done in the Detroit area and also what he does, they do internationally. And we have come up with a concept for the first program, the first piece of this program. And we tested some concepts. This is the one that came out as the lead with kids, and it is antithetical to anything that we as adults would think about, but it's called Almost Worst Ideas. And the kids like it, and the kids get it, and we'll share the research with you on that. So Leo Burnett, why Leo Burnett? Well, they have an, they have an attitude about how they work and what they want to do. They, they call it humankind. They want to give um, people a, a meaning about what the product is. You may be familiar with them with the Blue Door Project I'm in, in Detroit, uh, when they were trying to promote kids coming to school in the Detroit public schools, and they painted all of the doors of the Detroit schools blue and had a, a very successful campaign for two or three years with that Blue Door Project. 
Another one that in the northern uh, suburbs in Troy, there was a library campaign to increase the millage for the library. It was getting an anti-push from uh, some <coughs> folks who just thought it was another tax and wanted it not to be <coughs> raised and said no, vote no, close the libraries. And so Leo Burnett designed the book burning campaign and invited people to come to a book burning. And the day was the date of the book burning was the day after the election. And so if a, a no vote would have resulted in no library, which was comparable to a book burning, which got people's attention. And I think most of you are familiar with Mayhem, which is a national campaign that um, Leo Burnett is responsible for. So uh, we think Leo Burnett's got cachet and has got a good good track record with things that they do, both in the state and internationally. I'm going to turn this back now to Kristen to talk about the data. But I do want to share with you before, because I didn't do this before, you don't have the background on her that I do. Kristen, as you can tell, does this for a living. She has a passion for this. She works with Scholastic <coughs> in some of their projects. She's also, I want you to know, a school board member and the mother of five boys. And so she's got it up close oh, wow. and real. <laughs> and she also has the talent and the skills. Oh, thank you. Really. Um, <laughs> You look so calm. To do this really well. <laughs> <laughs> <She's just laughs> That's because they're back in Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> so she, she's got a broad base of, of uh, understanding about this work. She's been doing this for a long time and um, understands how to do market research. And she'll share with you now some of the details. So um, we were so thrilled when it was Leah Burnett based in Detroit that really stepped up and said, we want to work with you on this. We held an event and we invited several advertising agencies to that event and it was Leah Burnett that really showed us that they got what we were trying to do and clearly the experiences that they've had with some local campaigns, they are not afraid to push the envelope and that's one of the things we just love so much about them. So we tested two concepts. A concept is not the actual advertising program or communications campaign. A concept is just an idea for something. And they did develop different storyboards and visual um, expressions of the concept. And we did some in-person interviews with children in the Detroit area. So the first time around, we talked to about nearly 40 children, and we learned a lot. We took cues from the kids on the different aspects of the two concepts that they liked. We blended things together. We took things out. We upped the emphasis on other aspects of the campaigns, all from what the children were telling us. So taking cues from them, we came up with one um, campaign. We have revised that campaign name several times, again, in response to what the children told us. And we came up with almost worst ideas. The premise of this campaign is to use humor, slapstick, and exaggeration, all staples of the adolescent vocabulary, to engage and grab kids' attention. The first thing I wanted to share with you about this campaign is that it will be multifaceted, and it will include both in and out of school components. So um, with all luck in fundraising, because the intention here is to have this be driven entirely by private funds, we'll be seeking donations within the coming weeks and months, um, you will see advertising on television, you will see videos on YouTube, you will see an integrated uh, website that is kid-friendly according to all um, appropriate COPA standards, et cetera. So I want to give you just a couple of expressions of this campaign. And again, I do want to stress that you might not see these images in the final campaign. These are examples of how the campaign would express itself for Michigan students. So the first thing that children would encounter, perhaps, are different kinds of images. These images could be on posters. That center image is actually um, a Klingon, so that's not actually a child walking into glass. It is um, it's an image of that. It's a sticker, if you will. Um, and that one actually says, walking while, text walking while texting, worst idea ever? Nope, but blowing off school is. And that's the message of Almost Worst Ideas, to present kids with these kind of humorous things that you know on the face of them are not very good ideas, and then pose them as, is this the worst idea ever? Nope, there's nothing worse than blowing off school. Um, on the water fountain, it says, drinking through your nose, question mark, worst idea ever? Nope, nothing's worse than blowing off school. And every expression of the campaign will include a drive to the website. The website name will be almostworstideas.org. And on the website, students will have the opportunity to engage and interact with content that will reinforce the message that there is little worse than not giving your full commitment to school. 
So the website will balance the slapstick humor, think America's funniest home videos and things of that nature with this very serious message about how important it is to do well in school. Kids know that. And that's why we love so much um, Leo Burnett's idea and their, their driving thought of people don't need another message, they need meaning. Kids know they're supposed to do well in school, and they can tell you all the reasons that us as grown-ups tell them they should do well, uh, but we really need them to feel it in a more visceral and authentic way. So at almostworstideas.org, images and videos of these almost worst ideas will be cataloged, and kids will be able to vote on the funniest ones. They'll be able to write in ideas for their own almost worst ideas. And then professional film crew will bring those ideas to life, either in still photography or videos, um, prompting kid experiences and contests about the funniest ones. The heart of the website, however, will be kids sharing their own thoughts, tips, and experiences on school. We know that most kids say that their peers ought to be the ones that inspire and provide motivation to each other. So the campaign taps into this by providing a safe forum for kids to do exactly that. At the same time, the lore of celebrity will be leveraged and captured because we did hear kids talk about, especially girls, about how exciting it is to see new music videos, to hear people from popular groups and bands talk to them about their school experiences. To promote student voice, the website will feature a page that encourages students to share ideas that they would like to see implemented in their own schools. And we do think that this idea right here is what will lend itself to a longer term commitment um, and different programs based on the importance of student voice. In school, um, there will be a program where teachers can opt in to receive and hand out stickers. Each of these stickers will have a single use code Kids love the idea of exclusivity. They love the idea of being the first to do or see anything and then share it with their friends. So that single use code can be used on the website to unlock celebrity content. It can also be used to earn power ups on an integrated gaming app. And the reason we felt it was so important to have a game component to this was specifically to attract the boys. Um, as we all know, and I don't just know this because I have five sons, uh, but we see especially young people and young boys playing on handheld devices all the time. So that too, that game app experience will end with a drive to the website. So imagine crashing and burning in Angry Birds and then you get a message that says, almost worse ideas, uh, nope, nothing's worse than blowing off school. What do we ultimately want to happen? We want to get kids' attention and disrupt the way they think about school and learning. We want to surprise them. We want them to see those posters in school and be like, wow, I didn't think my school would ever do something like that. We need to get them talking about student engagement and motivation. We also want to give kids a way to accommodate the peer pressure that they feel and celebrate learning and achievement. We want kids to authentically discover that they are not alone in their desire to learn. We shared data with you last year, and this data holds for this year, that shows that kids personally value doing well in school, but they don't think their friends do. So they suppress their inclination to be enthusiastic in school. And we want to give kids a say in what and how they learn. The end goal. Our end goal is to give kids agency in their own education. We want them to own their education. It's the best way to get them there. When kids are empowered, they will engage, and of course, once they're engaged, they will learn. They will participate in that learning and go further with it. Um, we think that Michigan can be the test case for how we engage kids and promote their voice, uh, actively uh, promote their voice in our initiatives, and we want to try to build that. We're going to start small, but grow it as we go. And then we want to talk about who we need to reach first because it's not the high schoolers and it's not the very little ones. And Kristen has done some work on that and can share with you who it is that we need to get to mm -hmm. first. So what we saw in the data was that while student enthusiasm and motivation for learning doesn't ever start out at about 90% of kids saying, yes, that's what me, that's, that's who, what, how I would describe myself, what we do see is that as children grow older, that enthusiasm gets lower and lower and lower. So we wanted to make sure that we were talking to kids before they ever even got it in their mind to say, well, maybe I should detach from school. Maybe it's cooler to not try in school than it is to give my best effort in school. So we really want to target fourth through eighth graders. And I would suggest that some of the campaign elements actually appeal to kids on the younger end of that. So in elementary school, before they even get into um, middle school, I think we sort of take um, for granted that young kids are engaged with school and that doesn't always seem to be the case. So we want to get them 
them before we lose them. Because once you lose them, it's much harder to get them back. How do we know this campaign stands a chance of winning and working among the kids we want to reach? Well, we tested it. So we went to 200 Michigan students. We only talked to the fourth to eighth graders. And we said, um, OK, we showed you some images of the campaign. We got their reaction on some <laughs> elements of the campaign. And then we said, which of these two statements best describes the purpose of this idea? 71% said the purpose was to keep kids from blowing off school by showing them that even <laughs> stupid, bad ideas are not as bad as blowing off school. It's not 100%, but quite frankly, that's OK. If we start out with about 30% of kids thinking, oh, they're trying to tell me that I really oughtn't text and walk at the same time, or I really oughtn't take a selfie with a skunk, well, that's OK. We're going to get them. Because they're going to tell their friends, hey, I don't really get this. And their friends are going to say, oh, let me tell you what it means. So it's about making sure that kids are talking about the campaign. We know they think the message is valuable. 83% said, yes, kids should pay attention to the almost worst ideas concept. They had positive reactions. We asked them to pick the different phrases that describe the campaign that we showed them images of. 45% number one answer said it makes the point that kids shouldn't blow off school. You can see the other responses there, all the way down to 10% saying it was boring and 8% saying they just didn't get it. We asked kids to give a number of stars rating. 75% of kids gave the almost worst ideas concept a three or four <coughs> star rating, only 10% a one star rating. I'd like to share with you, we gave the kids opportunities as well as parents opportunities to share with us a little bit of what they thought <coughs> of the campaign. That is in your handout. Then what I'd like to share with you was from a parent of a sixth grade boy in Kalamazoo who said, I think that the game will really get the attention of kids, at least my kid. He really likes the silly human tricks things online and on TV, so that may get the attention of kids his age. And a seventh grade girl in Redford told us it's a great message with humor. So we know, and this is a piece of data from 2013, this has been the driving idea behind the entire campaign, is that 58% of Michigan kids said that students should be the ones to motivate other students. But our feeling is we can't just jump in with a student voice campaign because there are examples of that across the country. Connecticut has one. Texas does it. It's cool to learn campaign. They tend to attract the kids who are already engaged in school, the kids who already like school. We need to get the kids who are not so enamored with school. So that's why we feel so strongly that a campaign like the Almost Worst Ideas will attract the attention of kids who are not used to participating in their own education um, as active, vocal participants. So what are our next steps? First, we would like to launch, hopefully, um, fall uh, in the Tri-County area, in the southeast corner of the state. We, I would like to create a website with some vignettes and develop the app game. In school, we would have posters, some of the things you've seen along those lines. There would be bumper stickers, T-shirts, lunch notes, and things for use at home. And we would begin to reach out to other stakeholders, such as uh, school improvement conference and parent organizations, parent-teacher conference, that sort of thing. And I would tell you that we have been engaged with the Michigan Education Alliance from the very beginning on this, and they have provided us with input. And in fact, I have been asked now if they can use some of our vignettes to promote some of their work. So uh, we're kind of excited about that. Year two, we'd like to spread out to the rest of the state and uh, keep refreshing the ideas we had in year one, and then also start to sponsor student voice forums around the state, which would engage students in what they think and what they would like, and engage teachers in ways to make changes based on those wishes and desires. We're going to measure this. Uh, we're going to measure it on digital metrics, who visited the website, when did they do it, how often is an app being used, that kind of thing. We also uh, want to take a look at the percent of students who report courses are slightly or very dull. We hope that would go down in this process. Um, the percent of kids who seldom enjoy being at school, and these are some things that we already collect, and we can collect them and, and uh, figure out whether or not we're making any progress on those. And then finally, um, we're also going to use surveys and focus groups for kids in order to track what the reactions are to the, the campaign. So coming up, at, at some near point, we would like to start with a press launch and uh, push this forward. 
We're going to present to other interested parties. We know that the state cannot afford to support this on their own, with their own dollars, and so we'd like to approach foundations and businesses for their support. We have had some interest shown as we've been working on this project. We have had interest shown from some very promising leads. And uh, we also want to determine the implications for other, other programs we have going on. Because from this, of course, you go to, okay, so how will the teacher make this more engaging? How will the school work with kids to involve them? How do we get parents involved in this? And so uh, we've got a lot of work to do internally as well to be ready for a fall launch. So with that, Mike. So, <coughs> questions, comments, and we'll, we'll have our, where we go, one person, and then if you have a second one, we'll come around again. I think it was Lupe, then Eileen, then Cassandra. Or actually, Cassandra being a new person reelected here, why don't we, and then Lupe, and then. Well, thank you. I just wanted to say, first of all, I think this is great. It's a very well thought out um, plan, and I love the fact that you guys have really put so much work into collecting the data and understanding the audience and being very narrowly defined, which I think in most market brand uh, campaigns, that's the number one issue is being so narrowly defined that you can actually reach the audience that you want. So uh, w I think you've done great homework here. My, my question is, I mean, there's a lot of work. So how much do you think you're going to need in order to sustain um, the campaign? Mm -hmm. And then also, what does success look like? If you could kind of describe to me after two to five years how, how will you know that this has been successful? Okay. Okay. Um, we have a budget in place um, that if this campaign is able to touch, do all the touch points, including media, television, advertising, buying, we'd like $3.2 million for the first year. However, the fundraising goal for year one is $5 million so that we can enter year two with a base and assurance that the program will continue on. And we would like some long-term commitments from people when we approach them so that we know that we've got some viability. We know that nothing, you don't stop smoking among teenagers in a year, one-year campaign. We're now down to where they want to finish it, you know, just finish it with a teenage smoking piece because they've had such success, but that's taken a long time, and we recognize this as a long-term project. Um, for how will we know we're successful, first of all, uh, the metrics we have would certainly help us to point the way we will be doing the focus groups with the students, and that has been our, our most valuable asset in all of this. Uh, we had a, what we thought was a wonderful idea, and boy, did they shoot us out of the water <laughs> and tell us how wrong we were. And of course, I started this whole thing with, well, let's get a few celebrities and, you know, we'll just do a TV campaign, and, that, and they also explained to us how bad that idea was as well. Um, so getting those focus groups, I think having the educators buy in at some point down the road, I think it will take a little while, but having them buy in and think that this is being useful and helpful to them, and then our ability to reshape what education looks like, and that's, that's the big heavy lift on this, which is not covered in the campaign, but the work that we have to do inside the department. How are we, at, how are we helping kids? We targeted this at um, kids who would probably be eligible for Title I supports, because we wanted to know what it will take to reach those kids the most. And they tend to be, I don't want to make a broad statement here, a lot of those kids tend to be the ones who disengage early. And we want to figure out ways to keep them socially engaged so then we can get to the hard work that Melody and her team is doing. And to, and to Linda's point, Cassandra, I think um, we know that instructional quality is one of the leading indicators for success. Uh, we also know that there's something to be said about student investment in school culture. For those of us who have been teachers and school leaders, um, you'll notice, uh, you know, disciplinary issues going down when a kid wants to be there. You'll notice that students who don't traditionally raise their hand in class will tend to do that work when they want to be there um, for a reason that they've defined and this gives them an, an access point basically and so um, a lot of the school culture work that we're doing at the department but also in the field for those of you guys still in the classroom um, will certainly be impacted by this work as well long term. That's right so I, I just want to congratulate you I think this is great and for the foundations that are watching today five million dollars is a realistic goal so <laughs> step up. <laughs> Thank you Cassandra Lupe. Mm -hmm. um, I was a teacher, and I was a principal, and as I listened to you, all of these ideas, concepts, I would accept 110%.
because even going around the room, when I enter this room, and engaging our visitors mm -hmm. and staff, uh, they feel engaged, they feel part of, and so it's very, very important to engage anywhere you are. So in, in, when we want to teach children, it is very, very important to make them feel valuable, to feel them, uh, to feel that, make them feel like they belong, this is yours, this is your building, this is your classroom. And so all of these ideas, I would engage, I would support, I would embrace 110%. The only problem that I have is that you focused only on the east side of the state to pilot the program. I want us to uh, think more in the future of how we engage the west side of the state. I know that in my in, the, in my part of the state, this kind of uh, program would be uh, accepted strongly. Uh, teachers are looking for this kind of support. Principals are looking for this kind of support. Superintendents are looking for this kind of support. I, I cannot say enough good things because this is what it's all about, engaging people and giving them their value in whatever you're doing. And students need that. Uh, there's a lot of little things that I used to do in the classroom to make them feel part of. And the next day I would get a present. Oh, Ms. Ramos, I feel so good. Yesterday you asked me to clean the chalkboard. <laughs> or you know, real simple things. But people like to feel engaged and, and valued. And so this project does that. So whatever I can do to, to market it, to support it, to introduce it to my part of the state, I would be more than happy to do that. Let's, um, thank you, Lupe. Let's speak to, when we talked about this in Seuss Group, there was kind of a functional reason that the first year had to be clustered and then the second right. year could be expanded. Could you speak to that just a little bit? Sure. Yeah, some of the choice of location was driven by the availability to buy media in a bundled sort of set and to do some television advertising around that. Um, but the intention is for any school district that hears about this campaign, whether it's from us talking about it today or at a conference, there would be no excluding um, a district. So if a school or teachers wanted to say, hey, I'd really like to get involved, how can I access those reward code stickers, there was, there's no closed door. So the idea of starting in one place was largely um, a media buy consideration, um, but it does not prevent other districts or schools from around the state from being engaged from day one. Thank you. Uh, Eileen and Michelle, then Kathleen. Um, well, it's, uh, I think, a spectacular program. I, I served on the National Assessment Governing Board, and we found that the single biggest um, uh, motivator for children for taking the 12th grade NAEP was patriotism. And we just, the only thing we could do was to throw it out to the schools and the parents and the children and just say, this will help your country. They took it from there. In this particular case, you've got to lead them away from marketing and from distractions mm -hmm. to something that works again. I, as, a, as a mother of a 14-year-old boy, um, what I see is that as soon as my child hit and our previous children hit puberty, uh, the hormones kind of kicked in from, obviously, from saying, that's what mom and dad want to, hi, I'm me, and you're not. <laughs> so uh, creating, if you can change the child, you'll change the motivation. I think that's marvelous. Um, the, the one thing that I, I just, if you'll pardon me for a minute, the next agenda item, which is the uh, uh, college career and civic life framework for uh, social studies, there's an, a small excerpt that I'll never get to read there. But um, <laughs> students need the intellectual power to recognize societal problems, ask good questions, and develop robust investigations into them, consider possible solutions and consequences, separate, ev separate evidence-based claims from parochial opinions, and communicate and act upon what they learn. And in this age group, for 10 to 14, to start changing the way that they're thinking about themselves towards something that works for everybody is huge. I really want to commend you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Eileen. Michelle, please. Yeah, um, yeah and uh, I, I think this hits on a real issue, and one I've been grappling with is I've tried to um, raise and work with a lot of children and have seen people disengage um, and uh, had to take control, <laughs> maybe had more threatening control. They were, oh, they were afraid of me all until I graduated high <laughs> school. <laughs> um, so um, that choice thing is limited in my family. Um, but... 
uh, some of the, the so I'm, I'm looking at, um, and I think it's good to open this discussion and talk about the fact that, you know, you know, why are kids disengaged? Um, they are disengaged, but why are they disengaged? And I'm hoping that that, the further conversations will get to that. And I think, um, you know, my, from what I see, and I've, you know, everyone here knows this, but um, maybe new people don't. I'm, I'm a foster parent, so I work with kids who've been in incredible, incredible poverty and come from really um, disadvantaged homes, and they don't have computers. I mean, I know everybody thinks everybody has computers, but these kids, a lot of kids, especially Title I kids, as I'm sure a strong proportion of uh, kids do not. And um, they also, I've found, often want to go to school, but they don't have the structure at home to help them. And that's the number one driver. It's not the um, educational quality of the teacher. It is the, the number one impact on school outcomes is the, the, where they're living and their home. Certainly the teacher is the most important in the school, but these other issues. So I'm, I'm trying to say, okay, so this is a great idea. It starts this conversation. It will reach some kids, but I'm concerned about um, and hoping that further questions on this issue will look at um, why are some kids not even coming. So, um, uh, so my question is, Will will this initiative look at those sort of underlying uh, factors? And um, I just want to throw out one more. Like sometimes kids internalize things as normal. Like where my kids go to school, there's 50 kids in a classroom. You know, in Detroit, mm -hmm. it's oftentimes, and they just think that's normal, mm -hmm. and that can lead to disengagement. They might not even know to say that on a survey, um, and, uh, and but it affects the relationships they have, or um, if they're. I don't know if you look at kids taking online classes as opposed to other kind. I mean, like, so I'll stop. But my question is, how in depth is this going to get? Look at the sort of those underlying motivations, and what is going to happen with that information? Some some of that we've already asked, and we've already okay. had answers on, and would continue to go back and revisit some of that data and slightly redesigned questions as we go forward with this work. Right. Um, some of it we've not. I mean, we can certainly take a look at yeah. some of those questions as we go forward. And one of the things I'd like to add is um, I like in this campaign um, to when I was in school and the Reagans had that Just Say No campaign, mm -hmm. right, about mm -hmm. drugs. And some of us just came from families where we didn't, you know, families that you just described, where our uh, siblings were very in that drug-addicted world, right? right. Um, and maybe our families um, were a strong uh, variable that would have pushed us in a negative direction, but we had teachers and programs and assemblies and mentorships um, that, again, I would liken to campaigns like this. And again, that campaign was largely around drugs. It was a national thing that went on in the 80s. Um, and this one is really about getting invested in school. So I see this as a campaign that has a lot of uh, strings attached, including perhaps mentorships, um, school culture components that allows teachers to cluster around mentoring and coaching kids. Um, we know that those one-on-one -on -one relationships with kids are huge. Um, but this is just really a starting point um, that we, and a foundation that we hope to build on. Um, and so we are in the beginning stages of figuring out what that looks like and hope to not just do this in the field on both sides of the state, but also do some work here at the department and talking with different existing programs about how to materialize this um, campaign into a reality for kids. Can I, can I just ask one follow-up? I'm sorry. There's um, so, so there's, there's another initiative that I know that's that's been working on and that's been looking at. Um, it was with Maureen Corrigan and Dur you know um, Doreen Al Judge Allen and a number of other people where they were looking at where well, you track truancy, you define truancy, you track it, and then you do home visits to find out why yeah. kids are not coming mm -hmm. to school. And sometimes mm -hmm. the reasons you find are. Mm -hmm. are, are strongly related to socioeconomic issues, and then you try to have the services to help and get them to school. Absolutely right. And, and so I, I, that's one I would recommend if you could check any, that one out. Any way we can go with some wraparound services, we find that that's right. supportive and useful. Great, thank you. Oh, I think I'm next. Yep. <laughs> I think, I think uh, I'm next. Yes, ma'am, sorry, <laughs> Kathleen. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> excuse me. I think this is a very good start to it. I'm so glad you just said, both of you just said what you said because that was going to be my question. 
uh, I think it's good to ask them, uh, and you, I'm glad we're asking students, because I've been pushing this for a while, as Mike said. So that's a, that's a good start. But one of the things we know is <clears throat> that relationships within the school, t teacher, student relationships, or even with the secretary or the custodian relationship with yep. the student, mm -hmm. uh, someone in that school who's going to look out for that student mm -hmm. on a one-to-one -one basis, as you just said, Natasha. So I think that that's, that's really an important step, and the wraparound services are critical. Mm -hmm. But no, I remember when my my daughter was, my children were in elementary school, and schools were overcrowded, overcrowded in those days. It was back a long way. Uh, and we had a, got a junior high built, and we thought the kids from the elementary school, when they went to the junior high, we sort of set the tone of the school, instead of which kids came from other schools, and they set the tone. And my daughter came home and said her friends at, at, at this element from the elementary school who were classmates are afraid to act smart now. Just what you said. It sort of confirmed confirmed what I've what she told me you know many years ago. And that's been true for a long time that a lot of kids were afraid to act smart. And uh, instead of them setting the tone, the other kids were setting the tone, which was really very sad. So um, this is very a very positive step and I I do hope you'll, that, as you say, it's a first step, that the surveys and the ads and all that are good. And I wondered if uh, we, we're going to have a budget of, we're going to have a goal of $5 million, but I wondered if any of the television stations or radio stations would be willing to use do public service mm -hmm. announcements with this information. We would hope so, but we'd also hope that they'd want to do that at prime viewing times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In the morning. But, yes. but yes. The starters, maybe they would do some. That's right. right. Do the right. Children. Children. In the morning, maybe yeah. the ones yeah. Yeah. for the high schoolers. Yeah. Yeah. The high schoolers. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kat. Richard. <clears throat> yeah, I I have a different perspective on, on this whole on this whole thing. I I take a dim view of Madison Avenue techniques. Uh, I recall the D.A.R.E. program, which was so popular among parents and foundations and schools. The only problem is that the study showed it, it had no effect. In fact, it may have even had a negative effect. It got kids, made kids aware of drugs. And when they reached a certain age, and they say, hey, let's check out what they've been talking about. <laughs> um, the, the medium, it was Marshall McLuhan said, the medium is the message. And we could be reinforcing some of the very attitudes, behaviors, and values that, that are interfering with, with education. I think there's a reason why school was made compulsory, because no kid in his right mind, no normal kid would choose it, okay? And um, I, I can't help but contrast my views as a child with my views as an adult and, and rue the many bad decisions that I made in, I mean, I just took two years of math and, uh, in, in high school because I had the choice. And um, uh, if I were in high school now, I, I would be taken, I would have learned a little bit about calculus because of, of rules that, that we have. So I think that uh, another another flaw in in the assumption is that kids don't want to learn something until they understand what it's for. On the other hand, you can't understand what it's for until you've learned about it. I also see kids' behaviors, especially boys, but but girls as well. They tend to they tend to go towards structured hierarchical organizations. Everyone wants to get into the every boy wants to get into the football team, which is very structured, hierarchical, you don't vote on plays that you're going to take. Someone dictates from above. And, and when kids drop out of school, it's often to become part of a, a very structured, hierarchical organization like a gang or something like that. Um, I'm not saying that there's no place for materials like this, but I think the bottom line is this. All politics is local. I think that these kinds of attitude, the school experience is determined much more by the local culture uh, of the school community that they're involved in. And in order to control that culture, the, 
the uh, administrator and the teachers have to have definite authority. Uh, and I think that part of the strategy has to be uh, helping kids understand that Internet and entertainment is all make-believe <laughs> and, and not, you know, yeah, I, heard it's, I heard it's stupid to blow off school. You heard that on the Internet, okay? Do you believe everything you read on the inter here on the Internet? Okay. So I, I think there is, again, I, I, I'm not saying that there's no place for this, but, but I do think that uh, there's some assumptions that, that are problematical, and I know that part of that goes back to differences in educational theory. Some, some people feel that uh, kids grow and, and we just let them do what comes in, and others feel that uh, education is something very contrary to human nature and, and it has to be structured uh, uh, like the game of chess. Uh, and I'm, I'm of the latter view. So, But I just thank you for letting me throw some of those ideas out there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Oh, I guess one more I wanted to add. Uh, of course, no, he. <laughs> He, I've said enough already. <laughs> he, who pay, he who pays the piper uh, calls the tune, and obviously the the students that you're trying to change are not going to be the ones who are paying the piper. It's it's going to be other institutions and uh, and sources. So their their agenda might not be coterminous with with the stated agenda. And, I'm, and, I, and I don't mean to say that in a suspicious kind of way, but simply to acknowledge that that's how D.A.R.E. That's, that's how D.A.R.E. was a great success on one level with the donors and the participants was not a success in, in terms of its stated goals. And I'd, I wouldn't want to repeat that again. So. <laughs> Thank you for that feedback. I just I well, did have one other. Yes. I did one last question was, um, when you look at outcomes, are you going to be looking at graduation rates and if this actually makes an impact on graduation rates? I don't think that we're going to be able to do causality, but we certainly are tracking graduation rates here in the okay. state, and we would be able to see that. Remember, we're starting with that younger group, so it will take a while to get yeah. to that point. Okay. But it would be, it would, we would hope it would be one of the factors that okay. would get them there. Okay. Okay. Well, this was a, a start, and to try to give you a sense of where we are, we're, all the views are thoughtful, and we need to take them into consideration as we go to our next step. I, I would say, as an alternative ed kid in Brooklyn, New York, there were things that appealed to me different in this than maybe appealed to some other kids in a different environment. So I think there's something to that. And that's where these metrics, maybe as we drive down and see where the results are positive, would help inform how we proceed. Um, but thanks for this. Thanks for making the trip today. And uh, also, I want to, you know, Barb, many of you don't know because you're newer, but Barb was one of our. Uh, uh, Deputy superintendents in the department many years ago, and his esteemed colleague uh, Cindy Rubel is a, a former superintendent. We were colleagues together in, in Lakeview Battle Creek, which, by the way, I think is the governor's home district, isn't he? Where he went to high school. Of course, you were a kid then, but he uh, <laughs> and really appreciate not just the work on this, but other things you both continue to bring to the table. We're very lucky to have you in Michigan. So thanks, team. Thank I think. You. Thank Good you. start, and appreciate the time you spent on this. Where from Connecticut are you? What town? I'm from a town called Seymour. Oh, okay. I grew I up on Long Island in New York. Oh, okay. So. I was just in Newtown. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was only two or three towns away. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, we're going to, I think, two of our mm -hmm. friends are staying right at the table, and we're going to be joined by Jim Cameron. Uh, Jim, by the way, is a social studies consultant for us, and, and I think I'll let Linda speak to this, or Jim himself, but has a really good background uh, that he brings to the department, but especially some of the relationships he has with the field. So let me just frame this a little bit for you. This is not, this is not I should just start off by saying, to approve uh, uh, social studies standards today. Um, they were last updated in 2007. Uh, it was like my second year or so. That was a fun year. You know, many of us remember there was some thinking that we were trying to take America out of the schools. That got kind of testy for us. The College Career and Civic Life Framework for Social Studies, released in 2013, promotes a deeper understanding of social studies concepts through instructional practices. And Michigan social studies standards need to be updated to reflect this knowledge. Um, as with the science standards, 
what we're intending to start today is that we're going to share the implications of changes with you over the coming months here. This is not an overnight issue. So in March, we plan to bring you draft standards with a request to take that draft out to public comment. So this is even pre, pre that. And for those of you that are newer than when we've done this the last time, that'll be when we'll really ask you for what are your thoughts before we go out to public. You may just say, for the sake of discussion, a majority of the board might say, we don't agree with that standard that you have in such, an era, in such and such standard. Don't even bother to bring it out to public. This is one, I would just say this as bluntly as I can. This is something we think is worth preserving as a state board's authority. This is important. This is the substance of our work in the classroom. And uh, we can't let happen what's happened before, which is others that get involved uh, in, in what is your role. Having said that, we don't want to tempt fate. <laughs> so that's why let's, let's do this thoughtfully. Um, let's do this with involvement of folks in the legislature and others also so that we, we don't end up kind of in the, in, the, in the spot we were in before. So in March, we plan to bring you the draft standards with a request to take the draft out to the field for comment. We're targeting May for when we propose to ask for your approval of the final standards. And meanwhile, uh, we'll all continue to work with the field and the legislature to provide background and to listen for input on that final product. We're saying May. Um, I've said this to the team I work with, and you can obviously over, overrule this as you see fit. But I'm trying to get as many of some of the harder lifts done before you have a new superintendent who then has a little breathing time to get into their work and their work with you and their view of where this should go. So I'm happy to try to help make that lift before July 1, and that's why we're looking at some of these timelines. But, you know, as we go through each step, that would be for the board to decide. The main goal being preserve the board's authority and this important work as standards, um, one of the major authorities that you have. So with, uh, with that, I would turn it over again to Natasha at this point. Yep, sure. Thank you, Mike. Um, as some of you guys already know, content standards are usually um, revisited every five to seven years. And what we've got right now, um, or what we're using, we uh, put into place or implemented back in 2007. Um, and so the development of the college career and civic life project provided the impetus for the revisions that we're currently working on. And what you're going to hear is a, a presentation, um, the first in a series of presentations over time, that really speaks to um, an opportunity for us to do this very important work. Um, so I'll turn it over to Jim and Linda to present on uh, the College Career and Civic Life Alignment Project. And maybe just a little of Jim's background yep. for the board since this is kind of the first time you've been at this table. So, so Jim, we're, I'll, I'll let him talk in a minute, but we're just really fortunate to have found him because of his wide experience, not only as a classroom teacher, which is where the basic of his work has been done, but also his involvement in some of the organizations that are now involved in this work. Do you want to share some of that? Uh, I was a teacher at Saline High School, uh, 37 years, total of 40 years teaching taught U.S. history and economics. I was executive director of the Michigan Council for the History Education. Um, I worked with the National okay. Council for History Education, presenting at over 50 Teaching American History workshops in 20 different states. Uh, I served as the interim executive director of the National Council for History Education for eight months as a, a transition. Uh, and then I got the call to come to MDE. I've been on the Michigan Social Studies Supervisors Association, so when we talk about each of these content areas, uh, I, I knew the executive directors and, and these organizations from my work with MCHE. So I'm, I'm very comfortable with this position and, and uh, uh, enjoy it. We're delighted to have him. It's just been a big help to us. So. Uh, what we'd like to do with the presentation today is be, uh, get you familiar with um, career, I'm sorry, college career and civic life, uh, the C3 piece, talk about the social studies standards and some of the other things that we hope to achieve over the next few months and the work that we're going to do with you. This should be familiar to you. We used it in uh, science, and so it's the same sort of a, a structure. And today we're going to be talking about quality social studies instruction. Uh, we're going to be looking at some infrastructure pieces, uh, the C3 standards, and how do we get to some high leverage practices. So, that said, today, as I said, social studies in Michigan, what's, what's the current state of it? Um, 
how will we use the uh, C3 framework, what that's all about. And also we want to talk a little bit about the link to uh, Michigan civil rights initiatives that are going on to try and bring all this together in one, one package for you. Um, what's our status in Michigan with social studies? If you'll take a look at the chart, um, where we do have some trending up going on um, at the high school level, um, you'll see that the student achievement is trending down on our tests in social studies. And even where they're trending up, I'm not sure I'd brag it with mom that how well I was doing on it um, as a state if I had to write home to somebody about this. So we've got some room for growth and some things that we could be doing to help kids become more engaged in social studies work. Um, we'd like to improve performance through instruction. Um, Dr. Ziley said one time when I was in a, a presentation with him, we were talking about standards, and he said to some of the audience, you know, the standards aren't what's going to make it. It's the instruction that makes it. And I think we all know that, but you have to have a basis around which you're going to do that instruction, and that's what the standards are. So we want to take a look at the content standards and revisit those. We want to take a look at the C3 framework, which will get us to a better idea of some instructional pieces that we could be doing, leading us then to that quality instruction, and finally to student success. So that's the steps we'd like to go through. Um, as I said, uh, we've said uh, content standards were last updated in 2007. We've had some feedback on them that they are, there are too many standards and that it would do well if we could uh, just make them a little more tight, have fewer of them, be clearer about them, and have them be higher, have them be more rigorous, have them apply to a broader um, concept of what learning social studies is, and it's not just getting some dates down pat. It's not, that's not important, but it's not the key in how you utilize social studies learnings, to Eileen's um, quote. Uh, we hope that these updates will reflect that feedback mm -hmm. and also lead us to some necessary instructional changes. We're going to have Jim talk you through the process we're going to use for these updates and where we're going, you know, some of the next steps we're going to be taking. There are three steps in the process, as you can see. First of all, the updates. Uh, we're actively involved in that right now. Uh, grade level content expectations and high school content expectations uh, are being crosswalked with the C3 framework to identify the strengths and the weaknesses. Committees have been formed, um, pre-K through 12th grade, and representatives of higher education in five different committees. There's an update committee which is currently working and just about done with their work to update the content expectations. Then they will go to a review committee to review everything that has been done by the update committee. Uh, we are also uh, forming an instruction committee to provide exemplars for this uh, improvement. Uh, and also we have an assessment committee that will create assessment items that fit with the, the C3 indicators. Our guidelines, as Linda mentioned, fewer, clearer, higher. The idea is we don't want to move the target that teachers have made a lot of adjustments to these content expectations. They have a lot of good materials already, and we don't want to move the target on them. We just want to update the content expectations. The review section. Uh, recommendations to you, the State Board of Education, will be based on the, the update committee and the process as defined. Uh, again, pre-K through 12th grade and higher education people will be on a final review committee. So before you see much of anything, there will be a review committee when the updates are done, and then once everything is completed, there will be a final review committee. Coherence across content and alignment to C3 framework. Uh, we'll see more about this in slide 15 as far as relating the two. For implementation, the Michigan Department of Education will provide support and guidance through the process. Educator preparation and professional development, we are working with OPPS and the teacher prep institutions, many of which are represented on the organizations that you will see shortly. Alignment to school improvement, uh, we are hoping that this will make it a lot easier for social studies to be included in school improvement because it will be uh, much easier to understand and we'll see a little bit more about that in slide 15. Uh, assessment, we are working with the Department of Accountability Services to make sure that it all flows nicely together. I would, before we move on, I would just say to you this, so in upcoming uh, presentations, we're going to be talking about what does some of that support and guidance need to look like, what about the impact on OPPS and teacher preparation institutions, assessments, what sorts of things do we need to take into consideration in order to get to a good implementation strategy. 
these are not only our partners, but these are the people that are doing the work. Uh, the Michigan Council for Social Studies, Michigan Council for Economic Education, Michigan Geographic Alliance, and the Michigan Center for Civic Education, along with the Michigan Council for History Education. Each of those five organizations has two members on the Update Committee, the Review Committee, the Instruction Committee, and the Assessment Committee, and then one representative on the final uh, assess, uh, Review Committee. Uh, so two from each of those uh, are, are actively doing the work. Um, the sixth group is the Michigan Social Studies Supervisors Association. Uh, they are contributing members because those people are also members of several of these other content organizations um, and also provide some, some uh, committee leadership. The overview. We talked about development a little bit as far as the, the committees that um, Linda charged me with creating the various committees and, and we talked about those different things. Um, and it is a committee process, that's how we are developing what we are developing. Uh, alignment with instruction and assessment is very critical, <laughs> that we should not be updating content expectations without thinking about their implications for instruction and for assessment. What is not included? The C3 framework is not a federal ma mandate. It is not a curriculum. It doesn't move the target. We are just updating. And it doesn't replace the content expectations. What it does include is a framework for alignment, an inquiry arc for instruction, and we'll talk more about that in a few slides, and then there are literacy connections. Improvements, the arc of inquiry, this will be explained more specifically in slide 11, but it's a method of instruction and inquiry for those of you that have been teachers. Our uh, inquiry is, is nothing new, but this arc of inquiry, as you see, is, is a more structured approach to using inquiry uh, and fits well with some of the things that were discussed in the, uh, the previous presentation. Indicators and pathways. Indicators are similar to our content expectations, but a little more generic. <laughs> Pathways is the way we will scaffold those things, uh, those content expectations, and we will see this more in slide number 12. Um, it stresses literacy. Each of the four dimensions has a connection to um, ELA literacy standards, which have already been adopted by you, the State Board of Education. And as far as disciplinary lenses, there are the four cores, which are part of dimension two that we will see later in the presentation. Literacy elevates the purpose of literacy, expands disciplinary context of social studies. Inquiry literacies uh, can be very different, that just as when you get home tonight and pick up your book to read, if it's fiction or nonfiction, you will read it differently. Uh, when you are reading for geography, civics, econ, or history, you read a little bit differently as far as how you are looking. So those disciplinary liter literacies will come into play. Uh, as far as the disciplinary concepts and tools, uh, it's just a more organized way to look at what we already have. What we have here is the arc of inquiry, but it's within the four disciplines. When you look at the C3 framework for social studies, you will see that there are four dimensions. One, developing questions and planning inquiries. Two, applying disciplinary concepts and tools. That's where the civics, econ, geography, and history come in. Three, evaluating sources and using evidence. And four, and this is, I think, one of the more significant things about the four disciplines, uh, as well as the arc of inquiry, is taking informed action. To, to learn something in the classroom, take the test and forget about it, is not what we're about. That, that we need to implement that, we need to take a stand on various issues. So within that is the arc of inquiry, and I've identified seven steps, so stay with that same slide. That the first step is developing questions. We have compelling questions, we have supporting questions. And I will provide an example of that as we, we go through. Um, but these questions at lower levels would be um, created by, by the teacher to lead that discussion. Supporting questions, what do we need to know to answer that compelling question? And then planning inquiries. And this is where the students have input that now we have this compelling question about the Civil War or the Progressive Era or civil rights. Uh, what other questions do we need to answer to answer the compelling question? 
And so a, an inquiry is planned not just by the teacher but with student involvement. Applying disciplinary concepts and tools, as mentioned, these are the four core. Uh, evaluating sources uh, and using evidence, I separate those out when we talk about the arc of inquiry, but we need to, to evaluate sources. Um, that if you, if a kid comes in and tells you, the teacher, that, oh, this is the truth because I heard it on Fox News or I heard it from Rachel Maddow, um, it might have a little bit different perspective on, on how that is interpreted. And not that one is good or bad or they're both good or they're both bad, but you need to know uh, your source. You need to evaluate that source. Um, and then using evidence that kids have lots of opinions. They'll come in and tell you the absolute truth but they have no evidence as to why that is true or why that is the right solution. Uh, and so using evidence to support their position, their answer to the question. And then communicating conclusions. That's wonderful. Here we are in the classroom. We, we, we had discussions. We've had presentations. We've talked about a lot of things. Um, and we came to the conclusion that, A, well, now what? Bell rings. We go off to phys ed or practice or whatever. Um, we, we need to do something with that. We need to communicate conclusions um, that we want to encourage students to be civic participants, to go to school board meetings, to go to city council meetings, to write letters to the editor, um, and a lot of creative things that they can do with, with social media, with supervision. And then <laughs> taking informed action. Um, what's higher than voting? How many votes have you taken here today already? Um, that uh, Hopefully you took informed actions, and that's why... Um, people are in the positions they are in right now. Burris is probably already commenting on whether that's <laughs> <laughs> Now, this slide is a little more complicated, but, um, and we're missing some. No, we aren't. Okay, leave it right there. That's, All right. that's good. Okay, so um, slide number 12 is a screenshot from the C3 framework on compelling questions. So constructing compelling questions. Teachers will need to be in service on this, uh, and students will eventually learn too because they need to ask compelling questions. The red arrow going across leading to pathways is exactly that. Um, the C3 framework is in grade bands. So by the end of second grade, by the end of fifth grade, by the end of eighth grade, by the end of twelfth grade, um, what should these students know and be able to do. Uh, that is the, the pathway, the scaffolding, the learning progression. Within the red circle are two examples of indicators at each of those grade bands. And one of the things about the grade bands that, that the 28 states that are involved in this, um, it's very important that we, we realize that what some people can do in kindergarten, others might take till first grade or third grade. Um, and so again, this is not a curriculum each state can, uh, or each actually school district can create its own curriculum um, based on these grade bands. So what I'd like to do is give you a quick example of a compelling question, take it through the pathway as it meets an indicator at each of those grade bands. So for explain why the compelling question is important to the student, let's take a question that is, uh, what is freedom and what restrictions are there on our freedoms? I think K-2 students can, can understand that quite, quite specifically um, as far as what their freedoms are. Um, when your kids were growing up, could they wear whatever clothes they wanted to? Could they eat whatever they wanted to? Well, they had some freedoms there, but on other cases, um, you probably didn't le let them eat just anything um, that they wanted to and so forth. Uh, so they can understand that, the, the freedom and restrictions on freedom, even at a K-2 level. At the end of fifth grade, how do our freedoms and restrictions impact others, peers and adults? And that might be something, again, as parents you could bring up that, okay, um, and I had a daughter that used to put some interesting outfits together um, that even I thought were a little questionable as far as color matching and so forth. Um, you know, what impact might that have on how you're accepted by those of you in, in the classroom? Uh, and so what is the impact on peers and adults? By the end of eighth grade, um, how did freedom and restrictions on freedom impact American colonization? What were the reasons for going to the col colonies? What freedoms, religious, political, and so forth? And then by the end of 12th grade, uh, how do freedoms and restrictions on freedoms impact various civil rights movements? 
and it could be any one of a number of groups going, um, going for civil rights. And what, what freedoms do they have? What are the restrictions? Uh, and going from there. So that's one indication of constructing a, a compelling question in how it fits the pathways and the indicators. Quality instruction, higher order thinking skills through supporting and compelling questions. Again, the kids ask the questions. At the lower levels, obviously, the teacher needs to have more input. But as you go up the grade levels, uh, students will have their own compelling questions and supporting questions. It turns students from passive learners into historians, geographers, economists, political sciences, and researchers. It makes them active participants in their own education. And when they are active participants, they will be more engaged. Remember the previous presentation. Um, instructional practices stressing inquiry. Again, the inquiry is not a new approach. Many of you have used it in the classroom, but this arc of inquiry with its seven steps is, is a much more structured approach. And then supported with resources. Again, we talked about the instructional committee that is uh, working on exemplars to uh, help teachers use this in the classroom. You'll see a common theme here if you go back to the science work that we've been doing with you. We wanted to turn the students from a, a from being students into, and passive learners into scientists. And this is a case where we're trying to turn them in now into historians and geographers and that sort of thing. So moving them from passivity into active engagement and learning. So the impact on teaching and learning, and, and this is the critical part. Students become active learners in a systematic way, the art of inquiry. They become problem solvers. They answer questions. And they become active citizens by collaborating and by taking informed action. Teachers improve the quality of instruction through a method that promotes deeper understanding. And administrators learn what to look for in quality teaching and how to support the process. What we hope for then as a result of this is that we have students who graduate who are truly career and college ready, that they are able to utilize argument and reasoning to build a case that they can solve problems and they can communicate those, those uh, solutions both to their classmates and then using them in a broader sense as they get older. And of course we recognize that they would need to be able to use technology and those tools in order to do that. And these are the four pillars to a career and college ready type individual beyond the actual learning in any one of the sets of standards. One of the other pieces that we're working on through this uh, is the Civil Rights Initiative. Uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center gave Michigan an F on our um, standards, and this is our opportunity now to integrate some of the things that we know we need to change um, while we go forward. And so we are working with a group of um, individuals in order to provide civil rights examples that will fit our content expectations, our guidance, and our resources, to develop relevant instructional materials, and to provide assessment items that are relevant and will lead, lead students through discussions through that lens of the C3 framework. So this is a very important piece that we want to get blended in here and take care of at the same time. We'd like better than an F going forward. An A would be awesome. Our next steps, uh, we want to talk to you through uh, educator preparation considerations, some of the instructional issues, assessments, and our implementation timeline. So you can, you'll, we'd like to foreshadow those for you, that they'll be coming to you shortly. And um, the things that we would like to talk to you about next time will be teacher prep, professional development, resources aligned to standards, and school improvement. So you can look for those, some of those things to be on the next agenda item that we come to you with. That's it. You know, I've been embarrassed privately, and maybe now this is publicly, but I, I've noticed gaps. Maybe I could blame it on not being motivated when I was a Brooklyn kid or whatever, but but I think it's kind of a lifelong learning issue, but maybe helps us think about what triggers kids to learn it at the right time, not when they're my age. For instance, when the first tragedy of the Malaysian Airlines went down, I had to admit to myself, I really did not know the geography in that region the way I thought I did. And then it, you know, I was motivated to try to learn more about that and for whatever reason had a gap. The other thing Jim triggered, which was, I tend to lean towards one cable station, but I've been pushing myself to watch the other cable station also because I think you, it's too easy, what we're asking our kids to do, we often don't ask ourselves to do, which is it's too easy to try to hear the things that reaffirm what we already believe. 
um, and it's been helpful to me. So I, what I'm getting at is the earlier that can be learned, the better. You don't have to wait till my age. Um, so, John, you're first this time. A couple things. One, appreciate um, the 50th anniversary of the Michigan Civil Rights Commission and legislation. And I know, Kathy, you're aware Arthur Horowitz, the chairs that group, was eager, and I appreciate that you all are working well with them and the staff of the Civil Rights Commission to try to help make sure on this anniversary that we um, make sure we're, we're embedding civil rights uh, learning appropriately. Michigan's been a leader in civil rights, and that hopefully will we'll come through more, more fully. And appreciate you all really working on that, and also appreciate you working on this important standard development process. And I just one want to reinforce as we improve our standards, as we've done with embracing the common core, doing the science standards. It's it's about these these improvements that make these standards fewer and more focused, clearer, more rigorous, but also I guess more conducive to students learning for understanding and application, not just memorization. I just would remind us all that's why we improve our standards to make them more effective to help kids learn more powerfully. Uh, and this is a great um, effort and appreciate it. I have one question and that's um, when you have these uh, grade bands, are, are civics, economics, geography, and history all sort of bundled in each um, sequence? And uh, are we, in these standards, are we doing anything to um, alter the sequence of when things are taught in those topics? So I know social studies is probably the most difficult, if I recall, where people it's, it's taught in a lot of different times in a lot of different places in a kid's career, the different topics, and it's not been consistent. Are we providing more flexibility as long as they hit these bands to uh, support the bundling of those topics, or are we um, framing a different sequencing, I guess, uh, than folks are doing out there? Are we framing a clear sequencing, I guess? The, the sequence will be pretty much the same, that as far as updating that at each grade level, K-1, 2 through 11th and 12th grade, the content expectations will stay pretty much at the grade level that they existed in the original document. Um, we, we encourage integrated learning, integrating the four uh, social studies content areas, uh, and then teachers, are, teachers and school districts are responsible for their own curriculum, so if they want to do something at an earlier grade or a later grade, um, they may do that. And currently, if I can follow, are, are these four topics, are they supposed to be integrated at all stages, or are there some topics that just aren't taught except at high school, like economics, or taught indifferently or indiscriminately? Well, K-8, K especially more K-6, uh, they would be more integrated within the classroom because of the structure. The idea with the arc of inquiry, when you ask that compelling question, we, when we talk about um, freedom and restrictions on freedoms, uh, are we talking about politics? Yes. Are we talking about geography, moving to the colonies? Yes. Are we talking about economics, financial reasons, and so forth? So they would be integrated through that arc of inquiry. Question. Kathleen, then Eileen. Well, I'm so glad we're doing this. I'm trying to get social studies, focus, focus on social studies for a long time. Uh, so that's, I'm very glad you're doing this. But you talked about review committees. Does that include teachers, practitioners that are in the field now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, it does. Oh, that, I'm glad to hear that because frequently they're the last ones to be asked of, uh, <laughs> a lot of questions. Uh, I, there were a couple of other things I wanted to ask. Uh, in the... Uh, Uh, in addition to the civil rights considerations, which I think is, is good and it does tie in with our 50th anniversary, uh, there was a bill in the legislature passed the Senate unanimously, and it wasn't taken up on the House floor, but the, to teach more about genocide and, and the Holocaust, genocides in the plural, and the Holocaust as an example. Uh, they're going to push on the people who got that bill introduced are going to push it again, I'm sure. So I wonder, I know that we have something in our content standards on genocide, but I don't know if it's, if it's as much as these folks want, probably not. Uh, I, can you take a look at that and see if 
the bill, but the way it was introduced, it required, it has, was amended, and that's why I passed the Senate unanimously, I think, because it didn't say required, encourage or recommend right, right. or something. Yeah, so, uh, but is there additional information? That, because there are more, more genocides every, every year, so that could be included in the, I know we want to, we don't want to get more standards, we want to reduce the standards, but the, this is an issue that's going to be pushed by people that are really working on it. The, um, when it came up the last time, we asked Jim to go through and check our standards to see where it's explicitly called for and where it probably comes up. Um, and I do know that we usually find that the concept is first visited in any true depth in middle school, and it usually is through Anne Frank and her book that just uh -huh. absolutely grabs kids and they understand it because it's their peer. Yes. Um, and then it opens the door for more conversations at the higher levels of education with all the multiple kinds of genocide that we're finding are existing in our, in our world. Um, so it's there. It is not as explicit because that gets into curriculum. And where do you teach it and when you teach it is the purview of the district. Um, we just try to give them the, the grade bands and that sort of thing. So I'm, I will not be surprised to see it come back and we can live with it, but it, it is in its in its initial form, it was very prescriptive. Right, I know. They, they talked to me about it. I told them that, but they didn't believe me. <laughs> <laughs> so they found out. But I'm sure they'll be pushing it again. Mm -hmm. There are opportunities for that in, in the standards. Okay. Thank you, Kat. Thanks, Kat. Eileen? I had the um, uh, a good fortune to hear Henry Kissinger talk about a year and a half ago in Grand Rapids. and. Uh, he was asked the question of what the difference is between being Secretary of State when he was and Secretary of State now. Uh, his response was that it was the same problem that his great-grandchildren are facing in school. The plethora of well-presented, totally inaccurate, but compelling information on the Internet <laughs> and learning the intellectual skills to investigate, sort, analyze, and draw conclusions. So I am delighted that we're doing this, and I'm also really pleased we're doing it in such a, um, a uh, thoughtful and neutral way that we're going to provide our teachers and our schools and our districts and our communities the opportunity to decide what's important for children. Um, I want to bring up the uh, discussion, not here to solve, but I would like to see what the hearing process is going to be to make sure that there's as wide a possible net cast during that opportunity for public comment. Uh, because I believe that that will diffuse um, uh, later concerns that we didn't really process uh, information from communities and from citizens, especially in this area. Although it certainly seems as if every area has turned out to be important. So, but thank you very much. It's extremely well done. I am surprised that Henry Kissinger could be understood by you. Oh, oh. You can't hear him. That's how you what? That was my Henry Kissinger. Didn't go over very well. Michelle. Um, uh, well, I, uh, I think this is really important as uh, someone who was a social studies major in college. Um, I, I always thought that, you know, social studies, you know, sciences and um, math are all very important, but unless you really had an understanding of social studies, you wouldn't, in an understanding of the world, you might not <laughs> apply those skills in a way that's really beneficial to everyone, you have to understand how I fit into the world and um, <clears throat> and uh, to be an effective leader. So, um, the question that I have is on the graph w w with the proficiency, um, and um, I'm I'm sort of wondering why you feel the <coughs> proficiency is so low, isn't higher than it is. And um, I'm also curious about, um, so forgive me for not knowing, but who decides what test questions are going to be put, that are going to be asked, you know, like what's, uh, to decide if someone's proficient or not. Because um, I can see if, if there's, you know, social studies is such a, I mean, it's a great, but it's also going to be in a hornet's nest where, you know, some people want to have one version of history and some want, people want another version of history. But um, that said, and, and, and then, so I'd like your response on that. And I'd also like to know, um, one of the things I find is there's lack of understanding around labor unions and labor history. 
and that's often overlooked in um, social studies. And I mean, I know it's a controversial issue, but it's an important part of our American history, and it's a part of the civil rights movement. So, um, so that's what I'd say, because I think a lot of people do not understand the importance of labor unions, um, and I, I think it's 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 uh, it should be they sh it should be made known. So, um, so my question about. What uh, slide number is that? Um, this is on page slide two, four. the bottom. Slide four. four. Got it. Slide okay. Four. Yeah, so I'm just trying to understand why and will this help make things better? Or, um, so let's, let's, that's a good question on the who decides the questions, the proficiency, blah, blah, blah. So to that point, if you would give us a pass for a month, mm -hmm. assessment is one of the pieces we're hoping to bring to you. And I I think it's in a month, if not, it's two months. Okay. Um, and we'll bring the assessment people in, and they can describe the whole process to you, and then you'll be getting it right from them rather from us translating. So if you could give us a pass, I would appreciate that. Okay. Um, I will. And, and as far as why are the scores the way they are, um, we think a couple of things are going on here. Um, one, if you look at the uh, elementary and middle school scores, they are lower. And once again, we have had a lot of emphasis on math and reading. Right. And so what we need to do with this set of standards and with the arc of inquiry is figure out ways to integrate reading and Jim talked about that um, into social studies so that a teacher can get both the informational reading concepts across at the same time they're teaching the social studies concepts and so that should help us to build some of this um, and then having kids active participants in what what are those bigger questions, even at the K-2 level, helps kids then be able to do a better job on applying that knowledge when they get to an assessment situation. Those would be my guesses, and there, I'm sure there are many more. And I was just going to add to that, um, the literacy component is huge here because uh, history is really about being able to situate um, an experience in a larger context, a right. global context, right? And if you don't have that background knowledge and or um, that is complicated with the fact that you're not a comprehensive reader mm -hmm. um, that can certainly impact how well you're taking this exactly. assessment right, right. right. thank sense. you Cassandra please so I I want to piggyback on Michelle's question because uh, you know social studies was always my favorite class in, in school I majored in poli sci I think I liked it so much because it was the one class where I could actually think for myself um, with that being said though then we assess it and we're, we're having a great conversation today about critical thinking and the ability to determine the, you know, the sources. Uh, wonder, all good stuff, wonderful. But then when we assess proficiency in these subject areas, correct me if I'm wrong, but it ends up being a multiple choice test, right? So it really does go back to memorization and, you know, uh, kind of structured answers and so it seems like there's a, a disconnect there that we want these young people to be able to critically think but then when we assess them and determine whether they're proficient we're doing it in a way that really pigeonholes them into the quote-unquote right answer mm -hmm. so can you talk a little bit about kind of the, the dichotomy between those two things yeah I mean good observation and even though we'll go into more depth let's do a little bit of that today even though the assessment will be next month let's do more of that Jim's a little prepared. more today. One, one I agree with you as far as the bubble test and there's a group out of Stanford beyond the bubble that talks about these kind of things however um, you can formulate a question where it, it has a prompt and take a, a, a document could be the Declaration of Independence could be the Emancipation Proclamation or whatever um, and then you can ask questions about that, where students have to read to understand what is in there. They have to look at the source, the author, the time period, who the audience is, and so forth. And if they've learned how to do that in the classroom, now when they read that document, they've ne ne maybe never seen before, then when there's a question, it's not a memorization, it's a figure it out. So there are ways of doing that through a bubble and test. But that being said, I, I would much rather have a constructed response or extended response part. But again, we can talk more about that next time. Let's move towards that. Well, great. I think we're on time, even. So this is perfect. Um, thanks so much. And this working for the board, we're, we'll build up to bring to you in March the actual proposed standards and go to public comment. But we've got a few other things as uh, the team said to you today that we'll do before that in February. We're good?
Well, thank you, and let's recess for lunch. And um, what would you like to set as a comeback time? 12.45. Okay, 12.45. Is there anybody good for public comment?